Hi everyone, and welcome to or welcome back to my channel. I'm Laura, and in today's video, I wanted to discuss how we can officially study for Leak Code and also set up a study schedule for ourselves. I want to quickly go over what Leak Code is before then talking more about how you can approach Leak Code, especially as a beginner, and also setting up a helpful study schedule for us to make sure that we're actually using our time efficiently and not just doing the same eight questions on Leak Code, trying to game the system and hope that we get one of those eight questions on our interview. Let's jump in. So what is leak code? If you clicked on this video, there's probably a higher chance that you already know what leak code is, but for some people who may be newer to computer science or not as familiar with interviewing, I'll take some time to explain. Leak code, or LC as it's commonly acronymized, is just a website that hosts tons of different algorithmic slash data structures oriented questions. So given the input and maybe a function signature, how can you transform the given input to match the desired output. There are also some other considerations that go into how you solve the problem. One is, is your solution correct? The most important thing here when working with Leak Code's questions is getting the correct solution. Nevertheless, as long as your solution matches input to output, then you're all good on the front of just having a correct solution. So the second constraint is speed. How fast does your program actually run through all the test cases? And how long does it take to actually generate the correct answer? So speed is when you come into some of these trade-offs between iterative recursive solutions, or generally just different ways of solving the same problem. This again also ties in with the third constraint of space. How much memory does your program use in getting to the final answer and producing a solution? Speed and memory are gonna be less important when you're in an interview setting and answering these kinds of questions on the fly. However, you often find that as a challenge or as an extension to that question, interviewers will ask, hey, how can you actually improve the solution to optimize on speed and efficiency or optimize on memory and storage space? The basis of every code question will rely on some sort of algorithm or a data structure component. If none of this makes sense, then no worries. You have plenty of time to learn and there are also tons of different free resources on data structures and algorithms. The Leak Code site itself has some helpful tools for you as it's evolved over the years. So for example, you'll see that there are monthly Leak Coding challenges in which you just solve one problem a day, and this can be helpful just to help keep you on track, but we'll talk about that more later. You'll also notice that there are commonly split up into data structures, so arrays, strings, trees, graphs, stuff like that. Next will just be the problems tab, which is just a giant curated list of thousands of questions, ranging from easy difficulty to hard difficulty. To actually sort by company, you'll actually need LeetCode Premium, which is a paid feature, and I think it's around $100 a year. So it's up to your discretion if you think that that's worth it to you. So enough about the basics of LeetCode. Let's talk about how to get started in LeetCode as a beginner. So getting started with LeetCode is going to be a pretty terrifying experience as it was for me. I could solve some of the easier questions at first bat when I was just finishing up my freshman year, such as this jewels and stones problem that required me to only write two for loops, but I was pretty stumped when it came to even some of the other easier questions like two sum and literally any of the other data structures that involve trees or graphs or anything beyond for loops. Needless to say, leak code wasn't something that I easily picked up, nor did it really become any easier for me after going through my data structures and algorithms class last year. So that's why I'm making this video so you don't actually fall into the same mistakes that I did and hopefully help save you some time and pain on your lead coding journey. In general though, I would recommend before you start diving into lead code to just get a lot more familiar with the basic operations of the most common data structures. A lot of the structures that I mentioned in this video already, such as arrays, trees, graphs, and strings, are going to be some of your number one most used data structures as well. Without this background knowledge though, when you're trying to tackle a leak code problem, you're gonna have two things to learn. One is you're gonna have to learn how to solve the problem itself. And two is you're gonna have to learn how to use a data structure that is underlying the problem, which often is not going to be easy material. If we take this the other way around though, by actually learning how to traverse a tree and then starting to apply that to a problem, it'll make it a lot easier to look at a problem and say, okay, I need to use that tree traversal strategy that I learned earlier and I can easily see how it applies because it's asking me to find a leaf node in this particular tree. Another popular tip that you've probably heard is to definitely just pick a single language and stick to it. The most common interviewing language that I've seen people use is Python, and that's also the one that I chose to use just because it was easy to pick up and there's also a lot of readability in Python, but there are advantages to other languages. If you use C++, a lot of the solutions there will be pretty fast, and there's a lot to learn out there with the newest versions of C++, like C++17. Knowing how to solve a leak code question in a particular language isn't always going to be the greatest advantage. However, it can definitely help if you're trying to learn a new language or just get more confident in a language you already know. You'll also commonly find that when running into some interviews 
or online assessments that they restrict you to certain languages. The most popular languages I've seen are going to be Java, C++, and Python. So having at least one of those three under your toolbar is going to be a lot more helpful and applicable across multiple job interviews. I know absolutely nothing about Java, and so I was pretty freaked out when one of my interviews required me to use exclusively Java on the programming assessment. Needless to say, I didn't pass the screening for that one. But that was just one experience out of hundreds, and even if you do encounter something like that, it's not gonna be the end of the world. Just try your best on the assessment and then move on to the next one. Lastly, as someone who may be new to the coding, I think something that's really important is to just not give up. There is a huge depth of knowledge that you need to actually confidently solve many lead code questions. And so if you're just beginning, it can be really intimidating and stressful and depressing to not be able to solve any lead code question. After enough brute forcing and just staring at another written solution for enough time, you will gradually get there and build up your confidence. Another thing that I find handy with lead code is that they sometimes have free solutions written for you in a few different languages, usually two, and they also have a huge community of shared answers. And it's also tagged by different kinds of solutions. So it can be tagged by programming language, and it can also be tagged by just the type of solution. So iterative, recursive, pointers. All right, so the most important part, how to practice lead coding efficiently. Like I mentioned, there are thousands of different questions on lead code, and even more on sites like HackerRank. So how can you actually get the most out of what limited time you may have before your next interview to know how to solve that next interview question? I'll give you a hint though, and it's not solving lead code questions for eight hours a day straight. The best way to solve lead code questions, like basically any other way that you've learned anything, is to fall into a consistent pattern of when and where you wanna start working on lead code, as well as what topics you wanna to be focusing on for that particular day. It seems pretty simple, but it can be difficult to apply to concepts like lead code, where it's not something that we are given homework assignments for, or, or as intuitive as we want it to be. So let's talk about how to actually set up an efficient study schedule for you that is personalized and will also help keep you on track. Some of you might ask, well, why set up a schedule in the first place if I can just individually tackle problems that I think are challenging? To that, I say, I think setting up a schedule keeps you accountable, keeps you on track, keeps you motivated and also looking forward to what you actually have to do. And in general, just prevents you from having to go into that cramming mode of working on Elite Code for eight hours a day the day before your interview. I really only recommend leak coding for 30 minutes to an hour max if you have that time in your day. Otherwise, I think keeping it just to 30 minutes is a very manageable time slot, and it's also not going to burn you out and keep you motivated throughout the weeks. So let's talk about how to actually set up a schedule. Your schedule probably won't look super close or even remotely close to the schedule that I'm just hypothesizing here, hy hypothetically putting out here. So tailor it to see how you best, tailor it best to how you see fit. Say that I really want to practice the topics of arrays and strings. I'll quickly lay out what a seven day schedule may look like for you. So on day one, I'll pick two problems from one topic, say two problems that are dealing with arrays. So I'll probably split up 20 minutes for the first problem, 20 minutes for the second problem. So for each problem that I do, there are four steps that I recommend you follow. So step one is writing out a list of assumptions, sample inputs, sample outputs, and finally, your written solution of how you would solve this problem. Assumptions are pretty straightforward, but these can be taken directly from the lead code question page. It's really just about making sure you understand all the limits and constraints of the problem. When looking at sample inputs and sample outputs, this will help demonstrate that you understand the nature of the problem and what you need to do to transform input to a provided output. Lastly, when I mentioned the written solution, I write out both a written text solution, so how I would solve this problem written in plain English, as well as a handwritten solution in my programming language of choice, programming language of my choice. Once step one has been completed, I then move on to step two, which is actually translating my code that I've written by hand onto the compiler, the programmer, whatever you're using to write your lead code question solution in. As you work on your solution in the editor and have it compile and actually run and even solve the problem, I would definitely keep note of what mistakes you've made when you're writing your solution by hand. If there are any syntax errors in particular that you missed, definitely note those down in a Word doc or even by hand if you'd like. It'll help keep you accountable for any common mistakes that you make. And you can also reference this list later on in the future to see how you've improved over time as well. So step two is the translating slash actually fixing your solution up part. Three is after some time, five to 10 minutes, 
have passed and you still can't get the right solution, I would just probably call it quits at that point and compare your solution with the solution on hand just through the discussion section on that lead code problem. While comparing your solution directly often isn't the most helpful, if you actually spend some time looking through why you thought a particular way would work and why that doesn't compared to the solution that someone else provided, you'll get a lot more out of actually analyzing rather than just stealing someone else's solution and copying it for future reference, which is something that I did very early on and it took a lot of relearning for me to actually get to the point where I could understand what a problem was asking of me and replicate it to medium success. <laughs> So day two, you've completed both of these questions, successfully or unsuccessfully, it doesn't really matter. I would then switch to your second topic, which is going to be, in my case, strings. And in your case, probably something pretty different. I'll then go through the same process as I did with the two array questions, except this time with two strings questions. Pretty straightforward, this is just to help differentiate your days and make sure that you're not constantly doing the same thing, which will get very repetitive and boring very quickly. Day three, now I'd recommend you go back to the problems that you solved on day one and just do a quick reflection. Where did you go wrong? How would you solve this problem now? And again, hand write out a solution. Once you've done this, you can go back, type out your solution exactly as you hand wrote it and do the same kind of steps of refactoring and seeing where you went wrong if you did go wrong again. At this point, you should have a general understanding of these two questions that you've worked on from day one and you should be able to tack on maybe one extra problem, staying within that same theme that you used from day one, so arrays in this case. Day four, we wanna do the same thing, but repeat with the problems from day two, so the two strings questions that we worked on, and then maybe tacking on an extra problem. Day five, we wanna do the review process for an extra question that we tacked on, and then maybe tackle one medium level question or two other easy questions. On day six and day seven, you kind of wanna do the same thing, and I think you see where this is going. Generally, the idea is just you take some topic, and you split up the way you're learning into multiple different days. This reinforces learning on multiple different levels and it reassures you that you're not just doing rote memorization, you're actually going back and analyzing what you did wrong, as well as how you can improve your solutions or the way that you answer this kind of problem in the future. It'll also help you look at the patterns that are required for different kinds of questions and start to build up the skills necessary to actually know how to answer this question in a week or in two weeks. So the first week, I'd like to think of it as a base adjustment period. You can find out where your skills are currently, as well as what level of problems you need to start out at. If you're finding that easy problems are pretty easy and straightforward for you, then you wanna move on to medium questions for the following weeks. And if you're finding easy questions are way too difficult, then definitely stick with easy questions. Just as a reminder, just because it's labeled easy doesn't mean it's actually easy because leak coding and answering these kinds of algorithmic questions are going to be a completely different skill set from a lot of the computer science that you've done already in school. In later weeks down the road though, you may also find it useful to practice different kinds of ways of solving problems. I mentioned the three-step process of writing out all your assumptions, translating your written solution into a actual type solution, and then referencing and reviewing the solution. But to help spice up your practice a little bit, here are some other practices that you can incorporate into your lead coding schedule. The first strategy is to practice brute force solutions. Ignoring everything else that you know about the problem, can you come up with the most obvious brute force solution to solve a problem? You can use brute forcing to solve the two or three problems that you're working on for that day and then come back and revisit them on a later week or a later day and work through the process of revising that brute force solution and something that's a little bit more elegant and optimized. On those days when you're working to optimize your solution, actually take the time to discuss what it is the best possible runtime for my solution and what are any existing constraints on the runtime or memory space. Is there anything that is absolutely required in the problem that makes me have a minimum O of N runtime or an O of N memory usage? I'd also encourage you to look at different ways to optimize your solution. And looking through some of the lead code question answers, people have come up with a lot of clever ways to answer different problems. So if you have some free time, definitely look at those to see how you can spice up your solutions in the future. Not all of them will be very reasonable or very readable solutions either. Take what you do with a grain of salt. Another strategy is just to coldly go into answering a problem. Looking at a problem for the first time, write out a solution by hand and then copy it into leak code and see how it runs. Then go through the process of optimizing and then see what mistakes you've made. This is kind of similar to the overall strategy that I mentioned 
in just a regular lead code practice session, but you should hopefully get better at going into a lead code question cold without needing to write out a written explanation beforehand. Let's talk about how you can actually utilize the schedule effectively. If you're really in a time crunch, I'd recommend looking at the blind list of top 75 lead code questions to prepare for an interview, and I'll link that in the description down below. And you can use this list to plan out your schedule over the upcoming few weeks. If you have a little bit more time though, assuming you're starting now when I've uploaded this video in May, and you actually aren't going to be getting interviews until July or August, you have a couple of weeks ahead of you where you can actually space out your practice and tackle topics according. Another helpful resource is going to be this list of lead coding patterns that I will also link down below in the description and start to familiarize yourself with what kind of problems require what kind of patterns. Lastly, I'll leave you with some lead coding tips that I've discovered over the last few years. The first is to actually practice lead coding out loud as if you're doing a mock interview. When you get used to lead coding just silently, you have a lot of processes and assumptions that are happening in your brain, but when it comes to actually answering them in an interview, you can kind of freeze up and get unfamiliar with how to explain your thoughts. This could be helpful to just incorporate into your weekly practice and having one day where you record yourself answering a lead code question out loud or even doing a mock interview with a friend or a peer and seeing how you stack up. You can go to resources like Pramp or interviewing.io to practice interviewing with an actual professional in industry, and they will provide you some criticism and feedback on how you did. This is probably one of the best ways to get interview ready. So if you are on a time crunch and again, just want to be better at interviewing, then I would point you more towards these resources instead. I would also encourage you to check out my other video about a problem solving framework for any technical interviewing question, which I'll link in the cards. And this video goes over how you can structure your answer while you're in a technical interview and in the heat of the moment. Third is that it's also not a bad idea to practice lead coding with a friend or starting a club around it too. You can use a website called binaryresearch.com where you can create a room and basically just solve lead code questions together. Having people that are doing this with you is gonna be the easiest way to keep yourself motivated and stay on track. So round up all your friends, get them excited about interviewing and solving lead code questions, and look forward to acing your interviews in the upcoming season. So this is a collection of my best lead coding tips, as well as learning from my mistakes that I've made and taking those forward to help you be the best lead coder possible. Leave a comment down below about what your favorite lead code topics are, and if you have any lead code strategies that you'd like to share. For me, my favorite lead code topic was always the tree questions because it was pretty predictable. And once I had the basic idea of how to traverse a tree, I got a lot better at actually solving these kinds of problems, which is probably why I like them the most. Otherwise, a lot of the other questions are pretty hit and miss, but trees always have my back. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you next week for a brand new video. Bye. So if I didn't touch you, baby, you should know.